Hey, Amazing Spider Talk fans, it's Dan Gavazdan here. You might wonder what you just clicked on. This is the first episode of Annual, a new series on the Amazing Spider Talk channel. It's a true crime show that we're putting together about real events that are actually happening to me that you can follow along with in real time. So I hope you enjoy the episode and you get caught up in the mystery just like I am. We want to find out who is Norman Osborne. This is a Red Goblin prepaid call from Norman Osborne. An inmate at Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Insane. From Amazing Spider Talk on wherever you download podcasts, this is Annual. One story told year by year, sometimes. I'm Erin Janakio. For the last few months, I've spent far too much time trying to figure out who was sending packages to my friend under the guise of a notorious green Spider-Man villain, while also attempting to exonerate my husband. It's become a bit of a personal quest, one I can't put down. This quest sometimes feels undignified on my part. I've had to dig into the personal lives of people I barely know, their daily habits, relationships, senses of humor, and even about their connection to the post office. And I'm not a detective or a private investigator. Heck, I'm not even a crime reporter. But yes, every day this summer, I've tried to figure out the alibi of a 39-year-old man. My husband. Now, before I get into why I've been doing this, I just wanted to point out something I've never really thought about before working on this story. And that is, it is really hard to account for or attest to one's sense of humor and time to carry out an elaborate joke. In a detailed way, I mean. I've asked many people, would you send anonymous letters to a friend? Just how far are you willing to take a joke? And do you have the kind of time and resources to source a variety of letters from around the world in a game of cat and mouse that reaches deep into the target's personal space, invoking paranoia, months-long obsessions over who is safe and who isn't, and questions of why? A why would you do this to me, me, a well-standing citizen of good repute, beloved by friends and family? Why? These questions are hard to answer. Now imagine trying to convince someone of those answers. Especially if your answer is that even during a global pandemic that has us all trapped at home, you don't have the time to pursue a large-scale practical joke on your friend. When all you have is time. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Letters. Practical jokes. Green goblins? I'll explain in time. To demonstrate how hard it can be to pin people down, asking for honesty, I decided to ask some friends about why we haven't caught up during COVID-19 quarantines. I got a variety of answers. Erin, I told you, I cannot drop everything and chat with you whenever your anxiety about this goes up. That's Abby. She's 41. I asked Sheldon. He's 41, too. I love you, Aaron, but you have got to stop calling me. I'm busy, but more importantly, I can't talk for two hours at a time. I'm not going to lie, Aaron. I have all the time in the world. I just don't want to talk. Well, those weren't quite the answers I was looking for. But I learned something from this exercise. It's that it can often be hard to tell the difference between the truth and a lie amongst friends. You want to believe them at first blush. Surely they wouldn't lie. 
They are your friends. And yet, here's the case I've been working on. Almost six months ago, March 2020, a friend named Dan Gavazdin received a package in the mail. He was the popular co-host of a Spider-Man podcast, The Amazing Spider Talk. He was dapper, had a complete collection of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, and laughed in a really awkward way. (laughs) And he was unsuspecting. At least that day at his California home. It was the start of the COVID-19 lockdown. Everyone was still figuring out how their lives would be changed, including Dan. But he wasn't expecting this. A mysterious, unmarked package in the mail that would be the start of a months-long mystery. The chain of events that followed would see his life threatened by a fictional character who had somehow found his way into the real world. I'll let him tell it. So the first package arrived kind of like any other. I went down to the mail and found a package there, this little yellow package, and I didn't really think much of it. There was no return address. It was just made out to me and all right, fine, a little strange, but okay. So I brought it inside and I opened it up and, you know, this is probably early May. So shortly after the COVID stuff had all really gotten super serious here in the States. So there it was, there was a Spider-Man face mask inside of it. There was no name or anything like that. So I kind of just sat around on it thinking that someone would eventually claim it as theirs that they sent to me as a nice gift. And I thought I'd wait until then. But when no one stepped up to claim it, that's when I got really confused. So I made a post on social media that said, you know, I have some mysterious benefactor who sent me a mask. I'm extremely grateful for this kind of thing and thoughtful gesture. The funny thing is no one responded to that. No one took ownership of sending me the mask. So truly it was a mystery that continued onward and I got no answer for it even to this day. I first heard about this story when Dan drew suspicions towards my husband, Mark Janacchio. You see, Dan isn't just some random guy with a podcast. He's a random guy who is also the co-host of the Amazing Spider Talk podcast, alongside my husband, Mark. And while they may disagree from time to time about the value of annuals, our namesake, their friendship is time-tested season after season of their show. And yet, as the story evolved, Dan's suspicions grew towards my husband. When that happened, I knew I had to step in. First, to be sure that Mark wasn't involved in something I was aloof to, but also to allay Dan's suspicions. More on that later. Plus, Dan seemed desperate, so I thought, sure, why not? But first... Back to the packages. That first friendly package was innocuous enough. I wouldn't be taking this case if it had stopped there. Over a month later, I received another package in the mail, this time from Manchester in the United Kingdom. I didn't really think much of it because I got that previous package. It wasn't really that big a deal. Didn't know who sent it to me. But here was a new package. No name, just an address addressed to me, small little package. I pop it open and out falls a limited edition Green Goblin pin. Really great. Some awesome Ramita art of the face of the Green Goblin. But then there was a note attached to it. And the note just said this, perhaps I'm not a benefactor. Whoever was sending these to me was making a statement here. Maybe they weren't a good guy. The more clear statement to me was, that I was stuck in the middle of my very own goblin mystery. But Dan isn't alone in his confusion. His wife Amy responded to these packages in an entirely different way. So it was really suspicious when we got this piece of mail. In what way? What made it suspicious? The handwriting was not what I expected. How so? I expected the handwriting to be that of a nerdy mail because the previous package we had gotten suggested to me that that this was a person I assumed well versed in uh in Spider-Man comics and right most of the people I know 
who are into Spider-Man comics are male and nerdy. So if you're if you're playing the odds, okay. Right. So I was not anticipating seeing handwriting on a tiny sliver of paper that appeared to be that of like a 16-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. The eyes had little circles over them instead of dots. It was very fascinating. Wait. Wait, like like the act like the little bubble dots that someone could draw a happy face in? Yeah. Like a bubble. And so that got me wondering, who is this person? Why are they tormenting me now in this way? So I did have a bit of jealousy in thinking that this person is a woman now and she's coming after my man. That's dark. That's twisted. Right? You have nothing to worry about, Amy. There's no chance in hell that this is a woman <laughs> sending me these things. But do you think, is there is there anything in your mind, Dan, that might make you think that because of your role as co-host of such a prestigious Spider-Man-themed podcast that you could become a sort of sex symbol to a very specific subset of the population? I mean, I married him for that reason. Obviously. I'm a very lucky person to be married, but uh, I've seen the numbers for our podcast and it skews heavily male. Let's just say that. The story started like any other, a low stakes mystery that sparked long simmering tensions and threatened to push them to boil over. I too felt the heat rising. When Dan posted images of this new package to the internet, I couldn't help but get caught up in the mystery. Like Dan, I researched the address on the envelope and came up with nothing. Google Maps revealed images of a simple suburban house in Manchester in the United Kingdom. There were no obvious signs of Spider-Man fandom, no tortured references to a particular issue of the comic on a license plate, no statues of Black Cat visible through the window, no Patreon artwork framed on the wall. Nothing. Though, certainly, still, a potential secret lair for a supervillain. A small house, not unlike any other, sandwiched in between a row of closely packed homes. A fenced-in yard, cars lining the street, surely a competitive parking situation, and deep shadows beyond the windows, preventing my unwanted gaze. But the mystery whatever it was, hadn't evolved to the point that it required my full attention. A mask in the mail, a mysterious note, and a limited edition Green Goblin pin, they were all fun, but not out of the ordinary. The act of a playful admirer, most likely, and given the quality of my husband and Dan's show, not entirely unwarranted, if I do say so myself. I'll admit, even we investigators can be biased. But things would soon change, and not for the better. I'll set the scene for you. The main stage, an estate home on the fringes of Los Angeles. Chatsworth, to be exact. Chatsworth itself is forgettable. It's too far from L.A. proper to proudly call itself Los Angeles, but also not quite far enough away to qualify as Simi Valley or Ventura. It's the dusty exit from Los Angeles. A last stop on the way out of the bustling metropolis. Notable for its giant stone outcroppings, in some ways it can feel like a suburban grid of roads smack dab in the middle of Arches National Park. Chatsworth is more famous for Spawn Ranch, a 55-acre movie ranch and also the temporary home of the Manson family. If you've seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you know what I'm talking about. Chatsworth was also the former home of the once-busy Rocketdyne facility, which oversaw the testing of rocket engines, and the Atomics International Company itself a major contributor to our country's nuclear research. Now, Chatsworth is notable for Devonshire Street, a sort of western-style main street to the city, complete with an old saloon, 
a water tower, and where one can frequently see horses moseying down several prominent trails. But, like I said, it's still Los Angeles and part of a functioning metropolis. Loud horns blaze all day, and when nighttime comes, the streets function as twisting and turning corridors for speedsters who place everyone else on the road in mortal danger and wake up everyone else who is avoiding thrills at such a late hour. But if that wasn't enough action, Chatsworth also functions as the central hub for pornographic filmmaking and distribution in Los Angeles. Just head on over to one of the many local gyms and you are bound to bump into a recognizable face or two. Hey, working on those glutes I can see. If you are into that kind of thing. It's the kind of place people go to escape the busy city. But the busy city remains right nearby. But it's also home to Dan and Amy Gavostin, who work at a local high school and live in that estate home I mentioned. Not because they are the only high school teachers to make serious money. Exactly the opposite. They maintain an international boys' home that primarily hosts Chinese students. These students travel to Chatsworth for top-notch education and mentorship from the likes of Dan and Amy. For the time, Dan and Amy host seven teenage boys, and for their service are now allowed to live in lovely Chatsworth. Let's get back to the scene of the crime. The day in question was July 10th. On this particular day, Dan and Amy were lounging poolside in their backyard when Amy got a notification on her phone. I'll let her do the explaining. The U.S. Postal Service offers this program where you can see the mail that's being delivered to you on a given day. So any time a piece of mail uh, associated with your address goes through their big scanner, it takes a photo of it, and then those photos are compiled into an email, and you get an email telling you essentially what you should expect from the- Why are you getting these and not me? Well, because when we did our change of address last year, I signed up for it. Okay, that makes sense. So anyway, so I saw on this particular day that there was something coming in the mail for you, so I knew what was coming. And it was a a piece of mail. Uh, It looked a bit larger than normal size. And the return address was Osborne from Portland, Oregon. So, you know, that day I was sitting in the backyard as I have been doing a lot this summer, working on my script for a comic that I'm writing. And Amy comes running into the backyard and she's like, Dan, let's go to the mail. And I was immediately suspicious because it was getting close to my birthday. And I thought, oh, she's going to like pull us an early birthday surprise because Amy's particularly bad about surprises on birthdays. Yeah, I'm like almost more excited about spoiling surprises than I am about (laughs) surprises to begin with. So anyway, so I knew this package was coming. I get Dan hyped up on it and we go to the mailbox together and open it up and he sees the piece of mail that I knew was coming already. Osborne, I was like, all right, now this is a thing because we had not really had like the name Osborne on anything yet so far. There was the kind of benevolent tease with the Green Goblin. Now we had gotten into a full bore, like this was getting, this was taking on some character. So Dan excitedly rips into this package. Actually, he hasn't ripped into any of these packages, you guys, you should know he has been incredibly careful uh, and diligent about tediously opening these things so that it doesn't tear anything. In any case, he opens the package and what was inside? Yeah, I was expecting like a gotcha bomb, like like, like, like Harry Osborn does. You don't know this, Annie, but Harry Osborn used to send packages to Peter that exploded and said gotcha. Well, I'm really glad that didn't happen. Yeah, I'm very glad too. I could, I could handle what was inside. It was a, it was a card, a really nice looking red Spider-Man. I don't know if there was a theme to the card, but it was like actually a really like handsome card. And I was like, okay, this is friendly, but I was not prepared for what uh, was on the inside. So I opened the card up and there is in Spider-Man writing the kind of classic like a uh, you know, the amazing Spider-Man title lettering 
It was a riddle. Yeah, it was a riddle. And let, let's take it one stanza at a time. You want to switch back and forth? Sure, you start. All right, so here we go. Here's the riddle. It said, don't let handwriting and signatures turn you into fools. All over the world, I have many ghouls. If you want my identity, look to your collection. An anagram of my name lives in the titles of the selection. So below this riddle were a n series of numbers, and adjoining them were a, like a number of a letter. So if you look at all the numbers on the card, they were all from 1 to 39. So for me, it was like, okay, this is like, it's talking about my collection. This is like the Ditko run. I guess 39 is technically uh, the tra transition over to Ramita, but like this is appropriate considering the Osborne thing, because that's the issue where you know, the Norman Osborne reveal and all that stuff. Um, and that, and the end of that story. Sorry, Amy, this is really dorky, but you're a part of this now. Um, <laughs> so there's like a, a number of an issue and then a letter, what we found out was like the title of that issue. So we went through all of my Ditko collection and pulled out the different letters and we'll reveal what that spells. Yeah. Actually. So it, it would be a letter within the title. There, yeah, there were seven of these different directions that we were to follow. Um, on the other side of the card, there was a stanza that read, Now let's take a pause and reflect on what we've learned. All the letters to my last name you've successfully earned. If you haven't cracked it yet, don't start to squeal. Come the final issue, all will be revealed. So if you put all of the letters that you gathered from all these issues, and again, this is on my Twitter if you want to follow along, it spells Brooms Roman, which means nothing, but it's an anagram, and if you re-scramble it, what does it say? Norman Osborne. So we got it again. It was Norman Osborne. We know that this character, it's kind of a trick, because we did all that work and kind of found out nothing. So key takeaways from this, Portland, Oregon, which is very different than Manchester. Yes. And also that like there seems to be this implication that there are ghouls all over the world. So like this kind of scenario that there are many people helping out with this mystery. Right. But one mastermind, one Norman Osborn. One leader. So there you go. That was an exciting card. This conversation with Amy and Dan is what launched me on this month's long obsession. No, nah, let's say fascination with this story. Norman Osborn, the eternal enemy of Peter Parker and Spider-Man. The one man who, by my husband's telling, could and had threatened the lives of both halves of Peter Parker and Spider-Man's lives. Had Dan earned himself a supervillain in this Norman Osborn, or was this just a prank like any other? Peter Parker, Spider Man, and now Dan Gavosden caught under the dangerous gaze of a Norman Osborn. We now knew the chosen name of the mystery mailer, whoever they may actually be Norman Osborn. But what else could we learn from this new card? I had a few observations. First, we have the Portland, Oregon address on the front of the card. This new address might as well be on the other side of the world from Manchester, UK. Could this Osborne be multiple mailers? Could they be relying on surrogates? The interior of the card offers some advice on this. Don't let my handwriting and signatures turn you into fools. All around the world, I have many ghouls. The poem seems to be implying that there is one mastermind with many so-called ghouls, acting as henchmen, eager to deliver letters. This mystery was not going to be so simple to crack. I left this experience frustrated. I was no closer to solving this mystery, and neither was Dan, who had been worked into quite a lather about this. But this was nowhere near the end of the story, as it continued to escalate, no longer than a week later, on Dan's birthday, July 17th. But more on that after a word from our sponsor. 
Support for annual comes from Mail Gibbon. From Mail Gibbon. Mail Gibbon? More than 7 million businesses around the world. Using Mail Gibbon. To send emails, newsletters, and to deliver high fives. Mail Gibbon. Send better email. Very nice. I use Mail Gibbon. You do? I love it. I love birthdays. I've always loved birthdays. I'm kind of like everybody else in that they love birthdays, but like magnify that by a hundred. You know, when I was a kid, my mom would always do these crazy birthday parties, whether it was like Super Mario and she turned the whole house into like a Mario event. You had to jump and smash blocks and stuff like that. She would do big treasure hunts. We had an Aladdin birthday where we all got like hats and vests and we would ride around on these like magic carpets in the house, these Turkish rugs that my parents had. It was pretty wild and I kind of carried that forward for most of my life. I just kind of like to make a big deal out of birthdays. And so, you know, the the quarantine with COVID-19, it kind of puts like a, a wrench in all of that. But, you know, my wife Amy has been pretty good about delivering on nice birthday gifts and surprises. And I was looking forward to this year for sure. What were you expecting on this day? Honestly, I didn't know what to expect, but I would have never guessed what actually happened. It was the week before Dan's birthday and Amy was hard at work. So about a week, maybe like 10 days before Dan's birthday, I was really racking my brain about how to celebrate a birthday in the midst of a pandemic. I mean, I think we're all... Uh, reeling from that at this point. But in any case, uh, I'm sitting there thinking about a special thing that I can do to help him celebrate his 34th birthday. And I start to do some online searches for this. And I find this website um, where people can submit uh, video and photos of themselves and and video messages that can then be edited together uh, to create kind of a, a longer video Uh, card in a way. So uh, I I was really excited when I came across this. You know, Dan is highly sentimental and I knew that it would be really meaningful to him to hear from family members that we haven't seen in a while, um, you know, friends both near and far, um, and to know that people really care about him. So I started to figure out how this this website worked. and, And one of the things that you do is you create a main site and it's associated with a particular link and you have to send that link to the people you want to upload their videos and photos. So it's very secure in a way, right? You can really control who is receiving this information and you can also, as the person, you know, kind of compiling all of it, I had the ability to see everything that was being submitted and also put it in the order that I wanted the final edit to portray. So in any case, that's that's kind of how that came about. The day finally came. Amy had been hyping her gift all week, and as the dawn crept into the Gavazdan bedroom, their two cats begging to be fed, their sheets tossed about the room in a nighttime fit of restlessness, the two began to rise. So, Dan's birthday... I was beside myself with excitement. I had worked really hard to get all of these people in his life to send in these videos and photos. And I was just really excited to see his reaction, just knowing how sentimental and how like how much of a big softy he is. So I woke up first that morning, shockingly, because he's usually awake by the time I wake up. And I rushed downstairs to get my laptop and I rushed back upstairs and basically, I basically shoved the thing into your face. <laughs> I tend to be a little reluctant on holidays like Christmas or like birthdays about getting gifts early in the morning because I kind of like to like start my day up a little bit. I think everybody kind of hates me on Christmas because I very slowly open packages because I want to savor the day. And my birthday is kind of the same. And I, I know you'd been hyping this. So kind of delaying it a little bit further was was fun. Well, but here, I mean, this was such a, this was the sort of thing that would set the tone for the rest of your day. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm glad you did sh- uh, share this with me, but <clears throat> especially given the results. So Amy shoves this computer in my face <laughs> and is like, you got to watch this. 
immediately I knew I was in for like a really nice treat and a really thoughtful gift. It was like 22 minutes long. Yeah, it was long. It was a lot of people, uh, really wonderful people, some of who you'll meet on this show, you know, speaking personal messages, funny messages. A former student of mine edited together a bunch of like clips from movies that I've made in a way to kind of make fun of me. It was it was pretty great. One of the highlights, though, was, you know, but about seven minutes into the video, there pops up Mark, my co-host from The Amazing Spider Talk, with a really nice birthday message to me. All right there, Dapper Dan. It is your podcast co-host and good friend, mischievous Mark, wanting to let you know that um, of all of the annuals, I guess the one that does count are the annual celebrations of your day of birth. So obviously, happy birthday. Uh, you know, I, I know you're turning 34. So I actually went in and was like, okay, what's what's annual number 34? It's, it's this book. It's the annual 2000. Do we know what happens in this book? Of course we don't, because annuals don't count. It's nonsense. It's utter nonsense. Uh, why are we still having these debates? Every year, every day. But you know what? Your annual counts, Dan, and I hope I I hope you have a great one. So that was really nice, even if I disagree with him on annuals. Ultimately, the fight will never end. But then I was really not prepared for what came next. You know, it roll the next message. Hey, Dan, happy birthday! You know what they say: another year, another dollar. Uh, shouting out to you from Anchorage, Alaska, hoping that you have a good one. Uh, kiss the kids for me. Okay, so that message ended and, you know, me, uh, y- you listening at home might not know like what was so weird about that message, but I'm looking at this message and my first thought was, I don't know who this is, who this person is in this birthday message. Now, when the video ended, Amy paused it and she turned and looked at me and I thought, oh no, I'm doomed because this is a friend of Amy's and I'm notoriously like face blind. Like I'm really bad about recognizing people or remembering where they're from. And I thought, oh my God, I'm so screwed. Amy's going to ask me who this person is and I don't know who this is and it's probably a friend of hers. So Amy, you turned and what did you ask me? Do you know who that was? And I apologized. Uh, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't know who this is. And what did you say, Amy? I don't know who it is either. Yeah, we both had no idea who this person was. They both had no idea who this person that suddenly appeared in Dan's private birthday video was. Hey, Dan, happy birthday. You know what they say, another year, another dollar. Uh, Shouting out to you from Anchorage, Alaska, hoping that you have a good one. Uh, Kiss the kids for me. And yet, there was a face, a voice, and some more interesting details. Now, if you looked at the video a little more closely and forgot the kind of weird guy in the foreground... If you looked into the background, there was a whiteboard behind him. And on the whiteboard was like a to-do list. And in big letters on the whiteboard, it says, send Dan Gavazdan more stuff. Which, you know, seems like the MO of this Norman Osborn character. But the thing that's perplexed me all this time beyond that one message is if you look even more closely, There is my name again, Dan Gavazdan, but I can't make out what it says. The video is just too low quality. I've tried enhancing it, zooming in, all these different things, and I just cannot figure out what it says associated with my name. So that mystery lingers on. I had to talk to Amy about this. I'll note, you can hear the worry in her voice as the interview continues. I guess I really struggled when I was putting together the video, I was getting all of these clips from all of these people. And, and I naturally waited until the night before to start editing things together. Sure. And I hadn't noticed that there was a, a video from someone I didn't recognize. And so I was watching through all of the clips, putting them in, in the order that I wanted them in. And I click on this clip and it has the name Norman O on it. 
And I'm assuming you don't have any friends named Norman from from your reaction? No, no. Okay. And it was really kind of unnerving, you know, to watch mm-hmm. a video with a person I've never seen before addressing my husband as though he knew him personally. And I was really confused because, you know, obviously I had only sent that link to people that I knew and that Dan knows. And so I just seeing that video, I wondered, okay, maybe someone I know shared this with someone within the spider, Spider-Man, you know, audience, <laughs> this, the, his podcast audience. So wait, so there was, there was no way that someone could have just Googled Dan Gavazdan birthday video and no. said, hey, I want to contribute. No, it was a private link that I sent to a select few people, um, family members, good close friends, you know, people that we both know well. So the only way that that this could have happened is either someone hacked my email account or someone we know shared it with this other individual. Right. So, so one of these options is really, really dark and really disturbing. And the other is maybe a little less disturbing, but still absolutely confounding. Exactly. And unnerving. <laughs> Sorry. Is there any way to trace the videos back to the invitation that allowed them in? No. So there's no way for me... There was no way at that time for me to go and see the email address that someone had submitted this from. And and when I contacted the company to ask that question, they said that they don't actually keep that information and that it's uh, an optional thing for people to include their email address or not when they submit videos. Wow. So their privacy is protected, but yours is not in this one instance. Apparently. Now, Norman Osborne had pierced the inner circle. This wasn't just someone who was sending fun letters in the mail, but someone with a close connection to the Gavostins, or control over someone on Amy's mailing list. But Norman had also made a mistake with this unusual video. He had potentially given us a list of suspects to interrogate. Consider the two options presented by the inclusion of the Norman Osborne happy birthday wish. The first option goes like this. One of Dan's friends or family members had been following along on Dan's social media and thought it would be funny to ask a friend of theirs to record a video for inclusion into the video. This person had nothing to do with the Norman Osborne letters, but was a copycat prankster. They sent the video in, knew about Norman O., and tried to fly under the radar, now months later, without ever saying anything. This has happened before. Back when the Zodiac Killer was terrorizing the San Francisco Bay, it was notable that he would take credit for crimes he never committed. It was because of this that the SFPD could never get an accurate murder count. Could this be a copycat mailer? Perhaps, but I suspect not. My second theory actually gives us something to work with. There exists a list of names of who received access to the happy birthday video. Whoever it was that submitted the video under the guise of Norman O was either Norman himself or one of his ghouls. But whoever they are, the only way they could have submitted the video to the birthday message was by being invited by Amy Gavazdin. If we started with that list, we could narrow down our suspects. It was the best lead we had, and it lit a fire in me. More on that list later. But before any meaningful investigation could get underway, a few weeks later, another letter arrived at the Gavazdan household in Chatsworth. This one was the most sinister yet. This last letter was on a day where I hadn't actually checked my email from the U.S. Postal Service to see if anything was coming. I got really caught up with work that morning and I just went out to the, the, the mailbox when it was time to pick it up. So 
I go collect our mail. I don't even really see what's in the stack. And as I'm sorting through it inside the house, I notice this piece of mail. And what did it say on it, Dan? Well, it's addressed to the beneficiary, which is me. And the uh, mailing address or the send address. Return address. The return address. That's the one I'm looking for. uh, Is from the benefactor at 39th Street and 2nd Avenue. New York, New York, 10016. And okay, uh, we got another letter here. Let's see what was on the inside. So we flip it over to open it up, and it's got this creepy red scribbling all over the back. Like a child went to town with it with a red pen. Also, who addresses a letter with a red pen? I don't know. Uh, Maybe they also have it out for the post office. Maybe. Yeah, this had kind of took me to like the villain from Seven's crazy notebook like it was just kind of nuts looking so okay we we peel open the letter and inside is a green letter on the like green paper it's like a folded uh, you know tri-folded uh paper the kind of green goblin green with my initials dsg on them which kind of creeped me out because i'm not very like vocal about what my middle name is i'm, I'm sure you could look it up online You know, it was kind of like a level of like intimacy I wasn't really prepared to find on a letter like this. For those curious, S stands for Stuart in this case. Yeah, it's not Spider-Man as much as I would want it to be. No. So, yeah. uh, So, you know, that was on the on the cover. So you unfold it and the letter itself is really interesting because it was like burned on the edges and aged uh, like, like faux aging. Yeah. Faux aging. Yes. There was like stuff cut out of it. It looks like someone took a bite out of it in a, a couple places. So yeah. Okay. So here's what the letter read. You want to take every other line again? Sure. All right, let's do it. How do you like my little joke? A lot of work to end up broke. But I did not lie. That is my name. Myself and Norman Osborne are the same. At least in spirit. That much is true. But if I'm a villain, so are you. I'm made of flesh just like the rest, but in games of jest, I am the best. We've been enemies so very long. Watching you squirm, I must prolong. This can't end well, I promise you that. You are the mouse and I the cat. If you realize my identity, I will applaud. But if not, I'll remain a facade. So that was really creepy and like a level of threatening that I was not prepared for. No, the tone took a distinct turn into into dark territory. Yeah, but like still kind of fun, I guess. I don't know. You felt a little bit less fun about this one. Yeah, I really didn't like the tone of this message. I didn't like the accusation that if this person is a villain, then so is Dan, right? Like my husband is not a villain, okay? And also, this can't end well, I promise you that. Excuse me. Well, excuse me. I'm still having fun, uh, but uh, (laughs) it definitely stepped up a level. And there's a lot of really interesting clues in there to kind of like parse out. But uh, more on that later. It's important to note that the final word facade is spelled out one letter at a time. F-A-C-A-D-E. It seemed noteworthy, so I asked my husband, our resident Spider-Man expert, if this had any meaning. You see, facade, also known as full acclimation combat and defense exploskeleton, this is one of the great mysteries of Spider-Man history here. I mean, here is a character who uh, shows up, he kills Uh, one of the most popular characters in Spider-Man history and Daily Bugle photographer Lance Bannon. And then literally before this this mystery could be revealed, uh, the the writer, Terry Cavanaugh, who was working, a friend of the podcast, mind you, the character just, you know, it's unresolved. It disappears. Years later, he shows up and during the Dan Slott run and uh, Dan Slott, always the villain, doesn't give us the satisfaction of who this character is. So you see the fact that Dan's letter ends with a mention of facade this 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 mystery is bound to go on forever now we will never know and ah uh, how could we not know i could barely understand what he was talking about surely whoever this mailer was must be not only a huge spider-man fan but be annoyingly hardcore about it 
First, the Ditko comics references, and now this. Or was this Norman Osborn consulting with a group of Spider-Man fans? Only time will tell. But then, another break in the case. So it's really important to describe how the lettering appeared on this particular note to Dan. Um, It's in an odd font where some of the letters look like jack-o'-lanterns, Others look like witches. Others look like crosses. It's it's like a Halloween type font. But another aspect of the font that's important to note is that some of the letters were different colors. So you had traditional black letters, but then some of the letters were highlighted in red, yellow, green. I noticed that right away. And uh, I started to quickly work to sort of figure out if there was anything to that sort of framework. So the the colors that were the same, so all of the red colors spelled out Dan Gvozdin. All of the yellow letters spelled out, look around you. And the green letters spelled to find me. In, in sum, it was Dan Gvozdin look around you to find me, or Dan Gvozdin to find me look around you. Either way, super creepy. Really creepy, but maybe another clue? Not one that we've figured out. I mean, I I look around my room, I figure maybe it's in reference to friends. I don't know. You started to suspect me again. A person person who knows nothing about Spider-Man. I did, I did. I mean, I know a little bit, but not to this degree. Yeah, so, I mean, your guess is as good as mine, and uh, we'll be getting to talking about some of that in a later episode, I'm sure. Um, But in the meantime, Mark found a break in the case. So the thing that stood out to me was the address, or the return address on that one envelope, 39th Street and 2nd Avenue. I mean, first of all, 39th Street and 2nd Avenue is not a real address. So I knew it had to be something fictitious. And I figured given the, uh, you know, what we have been seeing with everything else, uh, with this, this game that, that Dan has been put through, that it, it had to be some kind of allusion to something Spider Man. So I went to the trusty Google machine, did some different iterations with the address 39th Street and 2nd sec- and Second Avenue, and you know, put in Marvel, put in Spider Man, yada yada. Found out it's the Daily Bugle address. More trolling from our Norman Osborn. He's certainly living up to his namesake. But the look around you was a good reminder. A reminder that our best clue was behind us. It was time to dive into Amy's email contacts and take a good look at everyone invited to send Dan a birthday message. One of them had to know Norman Osborn, but which one? For me, it made sense to start at home with my husband... Mark Janocchio. Next time on Annual. I don't know why anyone would suspect me. I'm a horrible liar. How much do you know about limited edition Green Goblin pins? Someone is lying. What, you think because I pretend to be a reanimated Nazi skeleton made entirely out of bees in our basement, I would do something like this? The deeper we go down this rabbit hole, the more creeped out I get. Annual is produced by Dan Gavosden. Editing help by Rick Coast. Fact checking by Amy Gavosden. Special thanks to Jared Sams, the entire staff of This American Life, and my husband, Mark Ginocchio. Narration provided by me, Aaron Ginocchio. To follow all the clues, updates, and to submit your own theories on the case, head on over to AmazingSpiderTalk.com and join in on the hunt. Annual is a production of Amazing Spider Talk. Amazing Spider Talk.